You want the three to one? I think it's enjoyable. <laughs> three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Gary and Kenny Show. I'm Gary Kroger in Waterloo, Iowa, and I'm joined by Kenneth Seisler in Calabasas, California. Uh, what is it? Morning, afternoon? Oh, the two hour time shit. difference confuses and, me. Yeah. Okay, it's 11.05 here. Okay, so PST. it's. PST. 105 here. When did they see. figure out the time differences? There's somebody walking, you know, back in the day. They didn't really realize until we had, like, you know, technology that it was a different time someplace else, right? Uh, that's above my pay grade. Well, no, I saw your guy. So you're on the East Coast, right? And well, I'm on the Midwest. No, you are. But I'm saying right. back in the day, you're walking west from the right. east. And as you're walking, you're going, you know, it's getting earlier and earlier and earlier. Right. It was logical to have that six o'clock in the evening be roughly the same hue on the East Coast as the West Coast. I mean, that's sort of the idea. Right. right? But when did they understand the concept that it was actually th so a different Once they realized thing. the earth was round. Oh, so that's what, that long ago? Yeah, I think so. I mean, okay. I, 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 it's an interesting question, and I'm going to Google when were time zones developed. Well, and, you just, know, they're not perfect lines either. I'm they're just right. imagining that when you see these old Western movies and they're on the wagon train and yeah. they're all walking. They, and, and they change walking. their clocks. Yes. <laughs> right. When, when no, they change their sundials. It's not that they're changing their clocks. They're going, oh, my God, we keep walking, and it's not getting darker. It's getting lighter. It's getting earlier. So well, they'd the have time... to be moving very fast for this, too. <laughs> are, these, are these supersonic wagons? No, I'm just curious. I, that would be All me. Right. I would be on the wagon train. And by the way, you ever notice on the wagon train the people that, <laughs> that had to walk? <laughs> are you one of the walkers? <laughs> no, I don't want to be uh, a walker. But, but I want to know how come. Lear, <laughs> learn reining skills. You know, it's a skill-based caravan. Why can't I ride in the wagon? Well, you have to have a skill. You have to either be shotgun, so you have to be fairly good with a rifle, or you have to have some horse training. Well, I wouldn't go on a wagon you can't just train ride. if I was going to be a walker. I mean, you could be the cook. By the way, when you were in school, were you, did you ride the bus or were you a walker? I was a walker. You were a walker. It was, huh? it was two blocks. <laughs> okay. I the still would have taken the bus. The bus would have been a wire. You would have still <laughs> taken the bus. Of yeah. course you would have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was it was two blocks. All right, hey, uh, before before we go deep here, mm -hmm. we have a sponsor. Okay, and it's a little ahead. unusual. Uh, a book is sponsoring this program, mm -hmm. and I read this book, and I'm just going to give a little plug to it without giving too much away. Mm -hmm. uh, the book, and it's a great title. It's called "The Rescue Cat's Guide to Bedtime Stories," mm. and it's written. And it, this is a pseudonym, I know, by mm -hmm. Joshua Q. Livingston. Mm. Now. Don't be deceived by this because it sounds like a children's book, right? Well, it's, it's a tale, no pun intended, told by feral cats, but its parables are very adult. Hmm. So it's not really a children's book. The lessons in this are very uh, adult sort of exploration. Are there pictures? And, uh, no, there are some drawings, yes. Okay. Uh, but the story roughly is about this uh, writer who is struggling. I mean, we've heard that one before. But his life is turned around by <laughs> these cats. Um, it, it, I, I downloaded it on Kindle. I really enjoyed it. I know you can find it at Google Books, and you can find it, of course, on Amazon Books. And it is, once again, The Rescue Cat's Guide to Bedtime Stories. If you're a cat lover, you're going to love it. I'm not a cat lover mm. at all. Mm. But um, I liked the perspective of these um, feral cats. Okay. That's, that was great. I hope we sell a bunch of these to cats. <laughs> right. Um, it, which is curious to me because I, mm -hmm. I, people often define categories of humans by what animals they love or not. Or beetles not, or rolling stones, which we can Or beetles about. or rolling yeah. stones. So I'm curious if you're a cat person, a dog person, a non, a fish person. No, I have very strong opinions on this, Gary. W would you share them? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I've been a dog person my whole life. Yes? Never a cat person. My sister was a cat person. But there's a couple of things that I, I, I first of all, let me talk about what I like about dogs. Okay. I like that they're glad to see you. Yes. I appreciate that. Um, the other thing is that when they go to the bathroom, they can go outside. I don't care what anybody says about cat litter. But yeah, it's, it still no, smells like, it smells like cat, cat litter, litter plus litter. cat shit. Right. 
And I don't like the smell. No. So I don't my, think cats like the smell. Oh, well, that's really rude. <laughs> you talk about no courtesy at all. Um, so I'm very strongly a dog person. I like, I like a lot of things about them. First yes. of all, they just generally, you know what's amazing about animals is that as soon as they're born, and, and they see a human being, when I say animals, cats and, you know, pet animals, they see a human being and they're immediately, I love you. They lick you. You take a puppy. They lick your face. Would yeah. we do that? If you were born in a different thing and there was another species there, would you just jump on that other species and go, I love you, I love you, I love you? Well, you, you, and you sound like Ricky Gervais, who's a dog person, who, who oh. says, you know, dogs are absolutely perfect because they're, they're loyal. They always love to see you. They can be exhausted, but if you say, let's go throw a stick, yeah, 100% energy. Right. Whereas, whereas cats are a bit obnoxious. Now, I'm in a cat family. My wife and their children have cats hmm. the cats hate me hmm. i don't like the cats hmm. um i don't know what that says about me but i i do i agree with you i like creatures and my son that are happy now, to see me he humans with, too my son lives with his fiance and my son has always been a dog person but he is now in love with their cat and you know why because the cat oh. acts like a dog the cat acts uh, how do, like like you walk in the house and the cat's all excited to see you Runs in circles. You say to the cat, come. The cat comes. You throw something really? for the cat to bring back. It come, it's got all really? these dog features. It's amazing. Well, that, that's, that's charming. Huh. But, yeah. Not, uh, I, charming, truth but maybe not interesting. But. Well, no, <laughs> I'm a fish guy. I like fish. Now, fish are never happy to see me. They recognize the food when you, you know, they, they follow the food when you're ready to feed them. Yeah. I love fish. Yeah, I like but fish. You mean not that, like you wouldn't pet a fish. Well, you don't pet fish, no. But you watch them. You watch. And here's what I love about. So you like fish. to watch fish. I like to watch. And here's what I love about fish. I love their stupidity. Hmm. You put them in even a five-gallon aquarium. As soon as they go around that plant, they think they're in a brand new sea. They hmm. have no idea. <laughs> and so they just live in this circular. They eat and they screw, especially guppies. And that's all they do. But that's the kind of thing. I mean, you don't get, I mean, even with a dog or an animal, you get surprised. You go, oh, look at that. Oh, that's so cute. Or whatever. There's nothing spontaneous that a fish does. Is you're never looking no. in an aquarium and you're going, oh, he's never done that before. No, no, no. <laughs> Except it's fun to watch a male guppy. This is going south. Yes. But a male guppy literally gets an erection. I mean, it gets this fin that moves You've been forward. watching this way too carefully. <laughs> you're telling me you, you saw a goldfish's erection? No, not a goldfish. A guppy's erection. A guppy's a male, erection. You saw yes. a guppy's erection? No, th th there's more here, and we'll <laughs> stop very, very soon <laughs> down this trail. However, the, the guppy will fan its tail to get a, a woman's attention, a female guppy's a woman, a female guppy's attention, mm -hmm. and then it gets its erection, and it, it chases them. And you have to have two or three women to every one male because he will kill them from exhaustion, what from just simply trying to screw them. They're, 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 they're wired to escape. So they, they, they die from exhaustion because they're running away or they're yes. dying from exhaustion because he is just whamming the shit out of them. <laughs> that, that's guppy porn. That's, <laughs> no, no, because he exhausts them because they run Cause away. Because they're that's, running so far. It's yes. like enough already. I'm just going to yeah, die. And they will die of exhaustion. I would rather die than get fucked by this guppy is basically <laughs> what they're saying. Right. Wow. No, I, I just kind of caught myself on something. And it was inadvertent sexism, I think, talking about my guppies. Mm. And I said, the male guppy will wear out the women guppies. I think that's unfair to women. The female guppies. I mean, I don't think they consider themselves women. Am I, am I digging out of a hole that doesn't exist by male guppies and... Well, and yeah, guppies? but I wonder whether or not... It, it's really not important whether or not it's a female or it's a woman guppy. It really depends on what, what they identify with. <laughs> I mean, it could be possible the guppy identifies as a goldfish. Now, now you see, I was being careful by, mm -hmm. to, to backtrack it so as not to offend anyone. And mm -hmm. so you decided the way to deal with this is simply to offend the entire gender identification community. No, I think I'm being very uh, open-minded. By the way, have you met anybody when you say hello to them or say something yes. where they've corrected you and said, I've been I'm actually a they? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and what do you say to them? I say, uh, well, you know what I said to the one when I went to the airport, uh, 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 he said, I'm a, I'm a they. And I said, well, I only have room, room for one of you in the car. So <laughs> you guys choose. Did you really say yeah, that? You guys choose yeah. who you want to get in. <laughs>
Um, well, there, again, your flippance. Um, mm-hmm. I've got close family members that are very, uh, you know, that correct me a lot. Um, and I still make a lot of mistakes. I'm still somewhat confused on, you know. I, I feel no um, embarrassment if I said she and they corrected me to they. Because how would I know? Otherwise, you simply call everybody they. And that's, that defeats the purpose of, of your specific identification, right? It's amazing how confusing it is already. But this right here is confusing. Wow. I don't know. I, I say to simplify things. You know, yeah, I just... I. I just become uh, demonstrative and overly friendly. Like, hey, how are you? You. And do they say, I'm not you, I'm them? <laughs> I'm, th- I'm them. Oh, wow. Huh. I think that puts this in a nice little book. Now, you want to introduce re- our guest? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, because I want to reveal something about you first. Okay. Can I? Yes. Can I say sure. this? Yes. Ken, for the first time ever, yes. you are high on this show. That may be true. You told and me I say be- maybe true because I'm, I'm not sure if I possibly was high before, but this is the first time I will acknowledge it. You, okay, all right, fine. No, what was your, I don't get high. I really don't. No, I don't no, get high. What was no. your thinking by, about? Well, it was just going to be me and you initially. I mean, I do know that we, have, <laughs> right. uh, we are going to be having an interview that I we guess. did with Robin Duke. Robin Duke, on. Robin Duke. And I was thinking that I really hadn't put much thought into what we're going to talk about. <clears throat> you thought being high might help? Yeah, I thought perhaps, because I'll see the thing, what happens when when I talk about things that are just incredibly trivial, I overthink it. Like guppy sex? Like guppy sex, (laughs) right. Right. Well, exactly. All right. Or, or when did they realize as they were walking that it was getting earlier and earlier? <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> yeah, when does the sun was, come that, down already? <laughs> all right. Well, that was the, my first clue that, yes. oh, he really is high. Yes. As you're the, yes. the, uh, the history but it's great of time. To be, you know, but it's legal. I don't know. In Iowa, yeah. is it legal? Uh, only for medicinal purposes. We can't. Uh, oh, know, it's not recreational? It, it's oh, not recreational. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but no. it is in Chicago where I have often pointed out that my wife works and she enjoys getting high. That's so, fantastic. you know, edibles are her thing. Yeah, no, um, edibles are great. I like edibles too, but like I say, it's hard to control the dosage. Well, she, uh, you know, I had an anxiety attack mid COVID or something, and she said, Well, you've got to do edibles. Hmm. So I had some dosage that she prescribed. Right. And I freaked out. Not, not a freak out like I thought I had wings exactly. or anything like that. But I had an anxiety attack to, to overcome my anxiety attack. I hate it. Couldn't sleep. And I've never touched it since. Have I ever told you my Bill Maher story? Uh, no, but I think you're going to. Now I'm not, just because you said that. And then I'm just, going, to prove, no, just to prove you wrong. <laughs> I, I am going to share a high story with you, too. But tell okay. me the Bill Maher story. All right. Uh, Bill Maher, which everybody knows, he's a, a, a big proponent of getting high and smokes yes. pot. <clears throat> so this was at, I think, the Aspen Comedy Festival many years ago. And uh, Bill was scheduled to be appearing at like the Aspen Theater at, at this comedy festival, you know, his one man show. And so I headed out going there and I was walking down the street and I noticed, of course, the street was Bill Maher, just him. Nobody else. And I was just walking by myself. And Bill Maher had done my show a couple of times and says, hey, Bill, how are you? And he said, hey, Ken, come over here. So I came over there and we're walking together and he pulls out a joint. And we start walking towards the theater where he's about to perform. And the pot was unbelievable. And I, I, I got so wasted. It was incredible. Maher has good pot. Maher no has good pot. There. So we get to the, to, the, to the theater, and there's the entrance to go in the front door, and then there's a sign to, for the artist's entrance. And I say, thanks, Bill. Have a great show. The place is packed. Gary Shandler, everybody's there. And I'm thinking, holy shit, I am so wasted. And Bill Maher is about to come out on that stage and perform. And all of a sudden, the lights come down, and the announcer comes on and says, ladies and gentlemen, Bill Maher. I'm going, how the fuck did he how do that? Could he he goes out there. Same high. Same he high. Goes out he goes out there like nothing, just like kills. Unbelievable. It was incredible. Whereas I, you're I, like a puddle of paranoid guacamole. Totally. Well, now, and I'll share my little high story. And it's why that, I don't get well, high. I, I'm a little high, so I wasn't sure. Was that a good high story? Th- that was a very good high okay, story. Okay, thank you. I, and I think a lot of people can relate to this. They might okay. not be able to relate to my high story. Okay. My ex-wife, when my son, Christopher, that you know quite well, mm-hmm. um, was 
a baby, not even one year old, were invited to a party. And they said, hey, we've got a babysitter. So everybody who's got babies, put them in like a, a nursery room. So my little baby is in there and we have this fantastic dinner with three or four other couples. And we have brownies and the brownies are delicious and we're all eating them, eating them. You know where this is going. She comes out and says, hey, those are pot brownies. Those are hash brownies. Mm -hmm. And I go, well, they're really good. And we're having fun. Everybody's laughing. We're eating more of them. This is what it's all about. This is cool. And then she comes out and says, my husband is having a heart attack. Holy shit. So all of that energy oh, suddenly yeah. went dark. Totally. Dark to where I felt trapped in this high where I started hallucinating. Everybody thinks they're going to die. The first thing, for whatever reason, I do in such a state. This guy's I, a real downer, by the way. I mean, he just, <laughs> yeah. he just took the buzz right out of the, the room. The <laughs> but here's what happened is I thought it would be a good idea in this state to take all my clothes off at a party and run outside. My logic being someone will see me and go, oh, my God, call the police. This guy needs help. Get his stomach pumped. It just seemed logical. I ran outside with my clothes off. My wife at the time, my ex-wife now, pulls me back in takes me to the bathroom. I'm peeing all over the towels. I mean, just, I'm throwing up now. Uh, uh, diarrhea. <laughs> it's horrible. And the thought that I- And the punchline is? <laughs> <laughs> the thought that I couldn't get out of my head is, what if this is my reality and it never breaks? Uh-huh. That was the worst anxiety attack ever. I would- Oh, I would get that when I would do LSD. LSD is the one thing where you look well, at it. Well, yeah, and you can't get out. And I thought, if this is out. my reality, I, I felt like this is, this is hell. I am, I am in hell. Mm -hmm. Eventually, my ex-wife, who got high a lot, just calmed me down. She was like, you know, that Dan Aykroyd is Jimmy Carter. You, you've taken some brown acid, you know. Right, that was, right, that right. That was Bill Clinton, but whatever. Um, and it calmed me down, calmed me down, calmed me down. I came out of it. I thought that two days had gone by. From heart attack to that was 45 minutes. Well, that's interesting. Did you ever find out what happened to the guy who had the heart attack? <laughs> he was fine. Oh, okay. He was fine. <laughs> he had a little indigestion. And you ended up with the, the chicken. And you ended up at the hospital. Uh, almost. Almost. <laughs> All right. Anyways, well, that's my get high story, and it's why I don't get high anymore. All right. I'm going to just put this in just the last thing, and I don't know if I've, I, I don't think I've ever mentioned it, but you know, because you can buy pot out here, you go, yeah. to, uh, you go to the dispensary. And the dispensary has Bud Girls and Bud Boys. And they're behind the counter. And by the way, these dispensaries are very modern, very clean looking. Yeah, yeah. And they're there to serve you. So you go over to the, um, I, I always choose the very attractive bud girl. I hope bud girl. Not, bud girl. I'm not, hope this is, doesn't offend anybody that I, I choose the attractive one, but I do. Um, <clears throat> anyhow, and she goes, hi, how are you? So hi. Um, she goes, what are you looking for? No pun for? intended. Yeah, I said, <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'm a, uh, well, I don't really know. I said, I don't want something too down. And I don't want something, you know, too, you know, I definitely don't want paranoia. That's for sure. I said, I'm kind of a writer. I'm in she goes, okay, writer. That's good. What's your genre? For well, real? Yeah. <laughs> I said, There's like Western pop? And, <laughs> yeah. and, and I said, I, I, pop? generally, I, I, it's comedy. So you like comedy? Okay. Com so you're a writer? <laughs> comedy. <laughs> yes. So I don't want anything that's going to make it so difficult for me to get up and write. I don't want that pot that like makes you lazy. Okay. So you're, <laughs> you're a comedy writer. Motivated. You, you need to be motivated. Yeah. <laughs> right? And you get this. She goes, I think I have something for you. A lot of the people I know who are comedy writers. They like this particular. You fit stuff. that description. They like this. What was that pot it, called? Oh, I, 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 oh shit! I have it in the Panama. other room. Panama. No, I, I, I do have it, but I have it in the other room because I just smoke pot in the other room. Laugh factory. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Right. No. <laughs> so well, yeah, I have so heard. that's that's. They have gotten so specific with pot. Yeah. You can do that. Now well, I, I have, have Jim Belushi. I have to have now you. get podcast pot. Pot. Pot, pot, podcast. I'm, I'll tell a pot in there, so. I'm in a podcast. About, so you, <laughs> it's kind of lighthearted <laughs> entertainment. <laughs> That's your assignment before the next show. Go get your podcast pot. Right. You know, I heard Jim Belushi interviewed, and, you know, he's a big pot distributor or pot imp impresario, and he talks about specific pot. I can't even speak intelligently on this. Right, no, the, the but specific. That's the, 
So pot that's how far, that's how we have come in the pot world. Well, okay. Mm-hmm. Well, I, hey, let me just say this, and then mm-hmm. and then let's let's go to Robin Do, right? Yes, Kenny. Yes, I like Hi Kenny. Hmm. He, Next time we should try Drunk Kenny <laughs> and see. Well, I want to get <laughs> look. I, I I love Drunk History on Comedy Central. Oh, right? Yes, yeah. I mean, it's hysterical. Let's bring on Robin. You want to tell us a little bit about Robin? I I'd love to. Um, and you know, Kenny and I we uh. We recorded this just a few days ago. Uh, Robin Duke is an old friend. People know her from SCTV and from Saturday Night Live. Uh, She joined us the other day from Toronto. And like I said, you know, SCTV is where I first got to know her. And then when I got to uh, Saturday Night Live, she'd already been there for a year. Uh, And recently, she's been one of the uh, recurring characters on Schitt's Creek, uh, which is discontinued, but it's been winning you know, Emmys lately. Uh, She co-founded Women Fully Clothed, the sketch comedy group, which is still touring the U.S. and Canada. And she teaches writing as a faculty member at Humber College in Toronto. Let's well, do you Roll remember? Well, no. Do you remember? We're, we're joining the conversation just as I was asking Robin about whether or not people get high or drunk on Saturday Night Live. That's right. Is that where we're going to join <laughs> yeah, this? Exactly. Well, you just said it. That's yep. fantastic. There we it's go. It's like we planned this. That's almost. <laughs> I'm really impressed. <laughs> People uh, imbibe before a live show? No, not really. I certainly I mean, did. I didn't. What I about, did. Before, what about? Look, at, you watch that Johnny Cash show. I am here. <laughs> Oh. For real? I'm, oh yeah, for real. I haven't. I don't think I've had a drink since, though. But, <laughs> because uh, of the Johnny Cash show, you heard that train of coming, coming around the bend. <laughs> don't coming you remember when we were? Weren't we all on stage? Were you there for that? I was, no, I, that's a year before me, Robin. Oh, okay, so I might have been sober. No, I was sort of semi-sober. What about pot? Right. Were people high for the live show? Drugs going around, right? But well, not Gary. No, <laughs> not Gary. No, not. No, Gary. we're not concerned about Gary. But you know, there was, there was, yeah. But you know, you the know. cocaine era preceded us. I think, didn't it? It, or, did. it was kept it away did. from me. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it did. But oh. the Winers was really clever. I thought for a one joke premise. Where did yeah. that come from? Well, it really just came from Joe and I walking around the, uh, you know, the 18th floor, uh, whining about nobody writing for us. <laughs> so it was nobody's writing us. So we just kept building on it and building on it. And I thought, I'm going to write the characters. So I went home and I wrote up, you know, I remember writing it up on yellow full scap. And... Um, an interesting story. I wrote it up on yellow false cap, handed it in, you know, how you used to have yeah. to do it early morning. And uh, I was way, I went in for, to get my, my sides, my pages for the read through on Wednesday and, and it wasn't there. It hadn't, they hadn't typed it up. So I, I went into Bob Tischer and I said, where's the winder sketch I wrote? And he said, well, it doesn't have any jokes on it. I said, well, it's it's like you have to hear it. It's like Joe and I playing these characters, you have to hear it. So I talked him in to putting it into the read-through. Where well, it that's interesting. Because yeah. I could see reading it and not understanding the characters. It would yeah. be like, well, what's this about? Two people show up at a laundromat and... And talk exactly. about their launch, you know, yeah, but what is that? It was is that they didn't actually whine. They would, they would kind but they weren't really complainers. They just made it sound like they were complaining. Like, I can't eat that. I've got diverticulitis. I can't eat that. I have diverticulitis, right? What, yes. I mean, that's not a poor man's version. Which I have now. But anyway, <laughs> that's enough. <laughs> well, now, Robin. <laughs> Did, did, were, were you taking advantage? You know, we wrote most of the stuff, Kenny, that, that we did ourselves. Now, of course, there were writers and they were wonderfully generous at times. But I would say a lion's share of what you and I did, we had to write ourselves because we weren't Eddie Murphy, right? Um, I never got a writing credit. Did oh, you? Because you're a bona fide writer. I went in the uh, second year and I went in to apply as a writer and I had a stack of scripts that had made uh, air the year before. So I had more scripts making air than some of the writers did. So they had to hire me as a writer. I wasn't that smart because I had a lot of scripts that I could have presented like yeah. that. But I was so afraid of just keeping my job on camera that I never wanted to rock the boat. 
I know, I know what you're saying. Yeah, because I, you know, I, uh, they needed writers for uh, one of the cast members the last year. I, you know, the last year I was there, and uh, I wouldn't give up my credit. So, uh, yeah. So instead of fourteen cents for a rerun, you're probably making twenty four cents. Yeah, I know. Don't you love those checks? I got a check for 34 cents the other day. I, I'm curious about this. You're one of the few people that can claim SCTV and Saturday Night Live. Of course, Marty yeah. Short. Others have come back like John Candy to, to guest Saturday Night Live. Um, compare them. W w which experience did you prefer? Where were you more free to be? I would say SCTV. Definitely SCTV. I was never comfortable doing Saturday Night Live. I was never comfortable with the camera and the audience. I never knew which, what to play, who to play to, the audience or the camera. I mean, Eddie was so good at that, right? Brilliant. SCTV was more, um, no, everybody had kind of free reign there to do whatever they wanted. And the only person that had to sort of get, stuff by what I would say was Joe Flaherty. You know, he was sort of the monitor of what was what was he good was and dad. what wasn't. And he I was think dad. He, I think uh, actually Joe Flaherty has, you know, his sensibility towards comedy has determined so much of what we see today. Hmm. You well, know, that's his, that's interesting. That's interesting. I, yeah, I think because that's I mean, valid. he was he hired Gilda Radner. He hired Eugene Levy, John Candy. He was the one that was hiring those people for the original Second City in Toronto. So yeah. his it was his watching people, looking at what choices they were making uh, that determined whether or not they got on stage. Huh. Well, let, let's look at the chronology here. You went to high school with Catherine O'Hara. Yeah. You guys are, are pals from time. Homeroom, right? Well, now she went on to do SC, Second City to SCTV. Yeah. She, now, correct me where I'm wrong. She left and then you came into SCTV. Is that yeah. where you came in? Yeah. I was her understudy at Second City and I was her understudy at... Uh, at MTV. She went down to um, Saturday Night Live. She was hired, but then yeah, decided not to do it, right? Live, and she called me and said, um, come down because I'm leaving. I don't want to, I'm not going to do the show. So they're going to be looking for women. What was so the reason I, she gave? I was thinking the same she thing. She wanted to, she just didn't feel comfortable with, um, with the with it you know i think she just thought this isn't the direction i want to go in i wanted to do film I, that's why i stopped doing sctv uh, and then you of course were at snl starting 81 yes but Catherine was there when i went up to meet dick oh yeah and uh and meet everybody right so she was getting she knew she was leaving she said come on we gotta go we gotta go you know just go i said but I haven't heard whether or not he's hired me. I was just hanging around all day meeting the writers. And she said, well, just go in and say, you know, I've got to have an answer because I've got to leave. And, okay, Catherine, I'll do that. <laughs> and so I did. I went into Dick's office and said, well, I, I mean, the guts. I mean, where do you get that confidence at that age? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, yeah, Dick, I'm leaving. I, I, I'd really like to have an answer. Okay, you're, you've got it. You've got the part. So I never auditioned. Really? No, I didn't audition. I just got the part thanks to Catherine pushing me into his room. Push. It was Catherine who's been, you know. I mean, you guys have been that. best friends yeah. since high school? Yeah, yeah. Did you and Joe, Joe said he's going to do the show. He hasn't called me back yet, but he said he's going to do the, Did you and Joe get along pretty well? I mean, you kind of went through the yeah. rough time together? No, with Joe and I always got along. Joe, Joe um, I mean, of course, we did the whiners, and I never had any issues with Joe. I mean, he, I would go into his office to write, and it would always make me laugh because the minute I was in there, he would get out a wet one, you know, one of those wipes. And oh, he okay, thank you. He's wiping everything down. Around he's a germaphobe. Him. Oh, he is a germaphobe. I, I don't know. Do you um? Do you have like the, a worst memory for, of one of the shows you did where you went, "Oh my God, this is going horrible," or where the, everybody just lost control and started laughing? Was there a particular uh, episode or a sketch that brings back memories of being, "Uh oh, this that was 
that didn't go well. I remember I was always like, I would always be looking in the monitor. And I remember one time Mary having to do this to me because we were on camera and I was kind of like watching myself (laughs) on the monitor. (laughs) And I'm looking pretty good. (laughs) What about you, Dave? Do you have a particular memory where it was like, this is either... Uh, we're dying yeah, out yeah. here, or this is hysterical. It was the Roy Scheider show, and I and he plays a scalper, and I'm a guy that goes up to him, and I have the setup line, and I I don't oh, yeah. remember what it was, but I said the opposite of what the setup was supposed to be, mm-hmm. so his payoff made no sense whatsoever. Oh, goodness, yeah. he gave oh, me no. a look on live television with daggers in his eyes. Oh my God! Yeah, and, and I carry it with me, and I, I blanked out the moment. You know, because oh I, I, I never want, I think I cut it out of the tape. Yeah. Oh, no. Those things happen. You know, it's live I, television. There used to be somebody, and I won't name names, one of the cast, who would come Who's not present. My, who would come into my office, close the door, and rant and rail about Gary Kroger. <laughs> and how, uh, how cutthroat you were how you were undermining him and he would go on and on and i'd like i would have to come to your defense gary and go are you, we're talking about gary kroger you're you're you, you know this is gary yes of course i do gary this actor whose kroger. initials are jb for some reason decided that i was the person most likely to take his stuff for whatever irrational reason, because we're nothing alike, his last name rhymes with Alushi. Um, we're nothing alike. Now, he's since apologized to me. He came up to me in a restaurant. He hasn't. Years, years and years and years ago. Oh, thank years and years God, ago. Gary. That's I was so at a restaurant in Santa Monica, and Jim is the other part of his name, came up to me and said, sorry. Wait, I'm still I was trying to piece it together. <laughs> oh, you aren't really. No, of course not. I <laughs> okay. And he said, Kroger, I was an asshole and I'm sorry. <gasps> and yeah, I had some animosity because he thought he should do Springsteen when I was obviously much better. There are things that I did, Julio Iglesias, that he wanted to do. He oh. just made me his foil for no okay. rational reason. No. And I it had was some. So irrational, Gary. I had <laughs> some animosity. And then he said, I'm sorry. And it all went out the window. I've seen him <laughs> since. I saw him at the 40th. And he was a pal. Oh, that is so great to hear. I've always prided myself on being a nice guy. It's not that hard to be. He saw it as an act. He saw it as a ploy in which to get on everybody's good side. And I said, if that was working, wouldn't I be in more sketches Hmm. or something? It didn't work being a nice guy at all. Hmm. At all. But that's what he thought. He thought I was full of shit. Oh, God. It was crazy. (laughs) It was hysterical. I well, laughed about that. My take on you was, Robin, carved out the life that you wanted to have. I didn't think that you were all about show business and the bus and truck tour of the business. You carved out a great Robin Duke life. And oh. now you're teaching, which I admire so much. And I'm frankly jealous. And I wasn't very good when I started. I wasn't a great teacher. I was really intimidated by the Did student. you have a master's? I did not have a master's. I have a master's now in creative nonfiction. Uh, but uh, I did not have a master's. I, I had my BA. And I didn't need a master's. I was very lucky. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I came in with a lot of experience. So I was, you know. But I get the impression that you really love your classes, the curriculum that you've created the process of teaching yeah, i mean you've now, been doing it a while now yeah now i do i didn't at the beginning i did not at the beginning and i kept like going the pension the pension the pension right and specifically <laughs> you're teaching what subjects i teach uh currently i teach uh improv okay. uh and i also teach acting and okay, the, the last year i did both of them on zoom and i absolutely loved it you're teaching right and and then Schitt's Creek comes along. A lot of people in America don't know that Schitt's Creek started in what, like 2015 or earlier? And it was on CBC for a while before yeah. it got picked up here by Netflix and seemed like a brand new show. So the, yeah. they were the first season here on Netflix was probably six years ago. 
And I yeah. know you came on board season two. So you're teaching, you're, you're doing a recurring role. I assume because you know Eugene Levy so well, and uh, and, uh, yeah. and 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 Catherine, yeah. give me a shit, give, give me a shit story. Well, I know uh, Daniel Levy since he was a baby, right? right? He and his mom and I are very good friends, and uh, so they had to keep stopping tape because I was calling him Daniel instead of <laughs> David all the time. <laughs> can you no, say it? can you say shit on Shit's Creek? Well, yeah, it's spelled with a C. Yeah. No, I know you can say the name of the show, but can somebody say, oh, shit, I stepped in shit? Would the, or would the, or would the, uh, uh, the censors say you can't say that? Oh, I don't think the censors would, would mind. Okay. To say shit? Certainly yeah, not just, a problem on Netflix. Probably a stupid question, but... <laughs> well, <laughs> here, no, I think it's a good question, but I don't, yeah, yeah. there's no answer to it. Mm. Um, so is there I don't a think shit they would write that actually I don't think they would write that word into it because it would cut into the whole yeah probably play yeah. On shit. yeah 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 so right. if they yeah. actually said it it'd it be it up might... shit's creek yeah and we went through an entire interview without even mentioning groundhog day which is the first time I saw you after SNL cuz you, you know we'd go off to go do our thing groundhog day there you are you know very memorable oh i love that movie that was such a gift it, it uh, really did was. You this, did you read the whole script before you uh, did the movie, or you just saw your sides? Or you oh, God, the whole no. Script? I read the whole script, and we had a table read with Bill Murray. We were all sitting around the table with Bill Murray. We had a table read. Bill Murray knew all of his lines. I didn't know my six. <laughs> huh. at the table read he was off book at the table read i what i was so freaked out wow but, but you weren't alone though right i mean he probably got the script a while back i mean I'm sure there were others did, reading but the just script. you know when you're doing the scene with him you know gary when you're doing yeah. the scene at a table read it you're, you look up, and he's trying to engage with you <laughs> at the table and you're like like this oh my god but in your first read of that oh, script god. did you realize i mean i read scripts all the time and stuff like that and i want sometimes i get it wrong and then when i see you go on, go on screen and go oh my god that's amazing but did you know when you read the script it was amazing because it's gone down as a classic nobody has been I, able to i, uh, I consider it perfect yeah, I, I, I would never have thought it would have got, been that great. I mean, I think I knew it was great. I was just excited to have a job to mm -hmm. be doing this. It didn't matter. You know, I mean, I was I was just thrilled to to be able to do it. And I had such a, a great time doing it and, and so memorable. I worked with uh, Chris. Uh, Elliot. Chris Elliott, yes, I worked with Chris on that, so it was really fun to see Chris again at Schitt's Creek. On Schitt's Creek, yeah. Well, Robin, we're going to let you go back to your life of all these things, but that's the obvious question. Are you going to continue in academia? Do you still keep your foot in the door of, you know, what can open with show business? Is there a plan over the next couple of years? Well, I, you know, there's Women Fully Clothed, which uh, right. I started at the same time that I started started at Humber, you know, which has been such a great creative outlet. It's been one of the best things I feel I've ever done creatively is working with these women and writing this show and performing live. It's just been, it's been truly a gift. It's been great. Um, is that a particular venue all the time or you just... No, we, we do theaters. We just, you know, we play big theaters, you know, 300 to 1,000 seat theaters. Okay. And uh, it, it, was, it was very successful. We've had, you know, life stuff happen and then COVID happened. We've written two shows. Now we're in the, we were in the midst of our third show about to finish it but then COVID happened so I, I don't know what's going to happen with women fully clothed but I just got um, I'm just going to do a film now with John Cleese which is wow. very exciting totally. and uh, which is happening right up here in northern Ontario so I don't have to go far I don't have to leave the lake for long so Robin, and I, I told you you're my hero. I oh, told you're you. a you're, doll you're, Gary well I am no, he you, just, he's, it's not really sincere 
I am no, sincere. Like, and, no, that, and you just so, used that like Jim Belushi said. <laughs> hey, thanks a lot. Thanks Thank a you lot. so Go much, back. Robin. I hope one day I'll be able to come up to Toronto and see your show. I'd love to. That'd be terrific. Oh, that'd be great. Hey, go back to your life. Thank you. And thank you love so you. much, Robin. A pleasure. Love you too, Gary. So bye nice bye. to see you. Bye I bye. love you too, Kenny. Bye-bye. Okay. We certainly hope you enjoyed that interview with Robin Duke. Uh, I know I did. It was great to see her after a lot of years, and she was really a very special person in my life. Anyway, the best of luck to her. And Kenny, it's you and me again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've established that you're somewhat high. Is that mm -hmm. tapering a little bit? A little bit. Right. A little bit? A little bit. All right. I'm just going to throw this to you. Is there any good news? Um, we've been getting a lot of rain and my grass is turning Let's green. Let's talk again. about that rain. You want to talk about the rain? Well, you guys have been getting a lot of rain. Well, just in the last couple of days. We've, we've had, had no a, rain for well, months I know. and months. I'm not, I'm not going to compare our drought to yours. There is, a, on fire. There, there is a map of the United States split right in half, which yeah. shows all of the flooding and rainfall that has happened in the East Coast of the United States. Right. And on our side, nothing. Completely yeah. dry. Now, we have well, oil pipelines that cross the nation delivering yes. oil to places Why not that water? need it. Why not water? Why is that not a discussion? Well, no, you can transport water. You can. I mean, you can put them in big tankers and things. It, there, there are ways to um, uh, circumvent reservoirs. But why not a pipeline? Like, just like have like a drain. A, they should build a giant drain. Well, like, like the, Tennessee. Like the way down. Mulholland brought it into the valley. Right, and so it should you, rain into this drain, go through the well, pipeline, and into uh, a once big Once again, reservoir. you're above my pay grade. It seems like something that I'm sure someone's discussing. I mean, there are ways to transport water. But this is the amount of water to put out the kind of fires can only come from uh, mother nature i mean well, I you know, guys I'm are in saying such mother dire nature, straits mother nature right now target aim is really bad <laughs> yeah really bad she well, may need a little help in from us to direct it to the places that need it you asked about the midwest we're, we're sort of caught in the middle of both of those things because if you look at a satellite picture we are breathing your smoke it's actually mm -hmm. gotten a little better now that we're mm -hmm. having some weather. But for That's a right. long time, my eyes were burning from smoke coming from particularly the northern fires getting caught in the jet stream. You know, my, my brother, a nuclear physicist. Wow, and your brother's a nuclear physicist? <laughs> yes, yes, it, yes. If we didn't look somewhat alike, you wouldn't think that we were related. But yes, he's brilliant and I'm, you know, I'm me. But anyway, wow. yes, he's a doctorate from the University of Chicago in nuclear physics and astrophysics. Wow. And what do you do? He's very that? smart. He works for the Navy, does research for the Navy research uh, uh, laboratories. Top secret stuff, I bet, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Really, like for, weapons for real. and shit, right? One time I went to Israel to make a low-budget movie in the early 90s. I got back and he was mad at me. And he's a little nerdy. Well, why didn't you tell me you went to Israel? I said, well, well, who cares? Did mom and dad tell you? No, you don't understand. You could have been taken hostage to get information from me. To which I said, Richard, what, what is it exactly that you do? Yeah, well, yeah. But he couldn't tell me. He couldn't. Oh. At that time, he was working at the Pentagon. But anyway, long story short. Wow. Does he know that you're a bleeding heart liberal? Yeah, we, we argue. We, we get into it. But he has redeemed himself politically because he can't stand Donald Trump. He well, can't good. stand the anti-intellectual, childish of, See, of that Trump. may be the thing that we have the smart people on our side. Yeah, the smart people are coming over. He's a scientist, so yeah. debunking science doesn't bode well with yeah, him. Yeah. But anyway, the point of the story is he said, well, climate change is real. Yes. And he's conservative, ideologically, politically, he's yes. conservative. He yes. said it is real. He doesn't believe, he thinks it's too late for us to do anything. Mm -hmm. And his estimation was, this is from a scientist, that in his lifetime, let's say 25 more years, the coast of Florida is going to be completely different. Then my it's prayers would, would have been answered. 
<laughs> well, then what? My prayers would have been answered. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, it, it's not going to disappear from the map, although oh. it will in you know in a thousand years or so. Oh. But in twenty five years, we're going to see different coastlines. I don't doubt this at all. I don't doubt this at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's an answer to. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's see if we can find a subject that we think of. Well, you fun. said what's good, and all I that's know. good here is we've been getting rain, yeah. and I love thunder showers, and everything's growing again. <laughs> Um, well, let me ask you another question. Afghanistan yeah. is a mess. Uh, you know, but I, I, I got to tell you this. I don't know if I should really, well, go into it, but here's my thoughts on Afghanistan. <clears throat> everybody is obviously talking about what a mess it is and how yeah. everybody's to blame, going all the way back to Bush. Of course. But, but before that, I, you can go back to the British mandate. That's right. But one thing that I, hasn't gotten a lot of attention, or I, I don't think it has, or I haven't seen it, is that for the past 10 years, the strategy of the United States has been to build up the Afghanistan army to protect and defend their country. They got 300,000 Afghan people to join these special forces Afghanistan army, mm -hmm. which their paychecks came from the United States. Literally, it was our taxpayer money that paid them because Afghanistan didn't have any money, obviously. Right. So they couldn't pay them. And we bought all the equipment for them and all this stuff. And for 10 years, our generals have been telling us that we are getting this incredible force together to defend their country when we ultimately leave and we will leave the Afghanistan people to uh, defend and for, for them. themselves. Now, there hasn't been much discussion been about this because... What happened is now in the aftermath, and, and I think Fareed Zakaria did this on CNN, which is where I got most of this information, is that <clears throat> in the past 10 years, the Afghanistan warlords and, the, and our, the counterpart, our military counterparts in the Afghan army have been, they've been corrupt. And they've been taking all them and they've been negotiating deals. So when all of a sudden this, the, the August 31st date was coming up, which I really had nothing to do with Biden saying it because Trump had negotiated. Well, Trump said May 1st. Right. You know, he, he made a deal with the mm -hmm. Taliban. How could that possibly go wrong? So the idea was that we were going to we we're going to leave. And as right. we left, the 300,000 American paid Afghanistani army was going to step in our place. Nobody on the American side, anticipated that they were going to say, sorry, we're not fighting. After all of that, they just, yeah, did you hear about one particular heroic military thing that the Afghanistans did in any province where they made a, put up a big fight against the Taliban? Not one day, not one, the entire thing just because of the corrupt politicians and yeah. of Afghanistan. Their president fled. Two days after the Taliban. So it, it is the question then, why didn't our own intelligence and our feet on the ground see that corruption and know that, that the army wasn't going to translate into a fighting force to defend themselves? No, my question is, why is, why is the media and, the, and us not talking about that? I understand the horrible thing, but I really want to know why we're not forcing the issue well, of not whether or not we knew or not. I suppose you can make a lot of argument. Well, if my general to ask well, this general, I, are you ready? I, go, yes, I did. And I think you're right. And I think maybe that will become the conversation. I mean, certainly what happens now in this polarized political arena is immediate finger pointing. Trump coming out immediately. Well, he should have uh, followed my plan. There was no plan to follow Mr. Trump. But immediately, it's one side pointing at the other. Well, Biden didn't know. Biden's an idiot. He's a doddering old fool. He's et cetera, et cetera. It hasn't been about the facts and the history, particularly of the region. It's just been who's, who's to blame. Well, I know. And that's been the conversation. Be, will it be okay for us to say the Afghans failed? The Af it wasn't America that failed. It was the Afghanistan well, I, I, army. Yeah. And they have this culture of corruption that failed. I certainly think that that's a, one of the, 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 the legs on the stool. I also think that the long history of, of our interference and the westernization of that region of the world, the nationaliz you know, nationalizing, drawing lines arbitrarily to neuter each region from the British mandate. Now, it's getting a little complicated. But it's a long history of corruption, a long history of our interference, imperialist, oil-driven objectives, 
that I think we've done no service ourselves, really. Right. But, to, to when, aiding but in the any, global world, but in the global world, there are situations that we see and we go, we can't just stand by and let that happen. Right. Well, here we stood by for 20 years. And so it was a protracted war because there never was an exit strategy, really. Now I'm faced with this because I never wanted to be there. But this is a human rights thing now. 500 Afghans murdered because they're women or educated uh, because they're vocal against the Taliban uh, or the corruption. But do you want your resources to help those people or do you want your resources to help the starving children who live in this country? Do you want it to help the homeless, which is unbelievable? Right. Well, well, here's the thing. And this, this is a podcast. This is an episode unto itself. Is That's assuming a finite or a very limited pie. I believe that the money is there for all of these things. It's just that it's in too few hands. Our structure allows one person to have, what, $128 billion? You know, like, like my, my son said, why isn't Bezos Batman? He can certainly afford all the gadgets. But we allow a certain small sector to have personal wealth that is 40 times the size of Afghanistan. So the money what you're exists. telling me is we are not going to be able to solve this problem tonight. No, we are not. Or, or, and, I, you know, and I don't know. I was in a conversation with friends last night over dinner going, is this going to fix is the polarity going to fix? Are we going to find common objectives? Are we going to uh, find uh, uh, moral authority again on the world stage? And I go, I don't know. My wife and I look at real estate in Portugal, you know, because we just want to be happy and breathe clean air and, and I'll get my fish and hmm. I'll eat them. Hmm. Oh, back That's, to the fish. Back to the fish. Let me ask you, how, how, how long is a guppy? How, well, and if, a, if, are there the guppies about colors? this long? So that's about two and two centimeters with a big fan tail. His uh, little guppy cock is a fifth of that. Hmm. So if a fifth of you, Did you ever were, see a guppy pussy, Sizler? Well, yeah, actually, I have because I've watched them uh, give birth. You're a sicko. You know, you, uh, <laughs> a female guppy <laughs> will give birth like to about to watch a dozen little you, guppies. You watch, it's the you, circle of you, life. No, because if the female you. guppy is exhausted and, and hungry, she will immediately eat her live children as they come out. <laughs> Cycle. Boy, the circle of life? Is that fucking what female guppies, they got to run until they die so that it's not to they get... Eat, they eat their children because you have to, as a, as a guppy breeder like myself, or like I have been, not literally, but having had guppies... I have to create little areas for the little babies to hide in so their mother won't eat them. There must be a parable in there somewhere. For well, no, I know, condition. but you, you have to think. I mean, here we go talking about how horrible humanity is, and then I'm thinking, well, maybe, you know. Well, we're not guppies. We're not, at least we're not guppies. Well, there, you know what? I think we've come to a satisfying conclusion. And that's what we are going to leave our listeners. <laughs> listeners at on. least we're not guppies. At least we're not guppies. Or maybe we're just not any worse than guppies. Hmm, no. All right. Okay. I think this is probably time for us to wrap up. All right. Well, then, uh, time to uh, go ahead and wrap. Uh, you, I, mean, you, I, I always have to do it. And you criticize me when I forget something, but the mm -hmm. reason I do it is because you you don't want to do it because you're afraid of forgetting something. All no, right. that's no, okay. no, 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 well, yeah, it's it, yeah, but I feel like we're absolutely fifty-fifty here. You just well, give but me no, the no, no, no. I'm uh, the yes, I do. but I don't have to do any of the business. You do all the business. Okay, all right, all right. Host, and host, like do, right, host, exactly, like and you're good at it. Okay, so folks, yeah. join us on Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts, and of course on the YouTube channel where you actually get to see us as well. And we do encourage, you have questions, you like something we talked about, you didn't like something, you want to add something to what we talked about, we've got a Facebook page, The Gary and Kenny Show, and you can write in the comments on, on YouTube. So long, Bye, everybody. Buddy.